Uh, I'll stop because we haven't got time to do it all. It's hysterically funny and to me exactly encapsulates modern education. Absolutely fantastic. Let, but let's now return because I don't want to waste any more time because I do want to talk about Conway. Let's talk about. Now I've sort of started talking about Conway last week. Um, because we started talking about the surreal numbers. Do you remember I gave you some uh, reading you might have wanted to do over the holidays to look up Nuth's book about surreal numbers? Uh, and the surreal numbers were invented by Conway, who's a completely amazing man. And that book is a completely amazing book. And I myself spent some time working through it again in the holidays following my own advice. And it was so much fun that one lecture, I think I'll just read something out of that book. Did anyone find the book or look up the book, Surreal Numbers by Don Nuth? Oh, oh, you got it. It's fantastic. It's very good. But I want to talk about some of the other things that Conway did, because he's, in addition to inventing the surreal numbers, though not naming them, Nuth did that, uh, he's done all sorts of amazing things. He was, in fact, the John von Neumann uh, professor at Princeton, uh, which is a really appropriate thing to do, because he's following in von Neumann's footsteps. And he's possibly still at Princeton now. Uh, first of all, uh, he worked out a really neat way of working out what day of the year any given date will fall on. So tell me a, a, a date, and I can tell you what day, uh, sorry, what day of the week it will fall on. And here's how he did it. It's called the doomsday method. He worked out for each year, there's a special day called the doomsday. For example, the doomsday for this year is Saturday. And the doomsday falls on the same pattern of dates every year. So the doomsday for even numbered months is easy. The doomsday falls on the 4th of the 4th, the 6th of the 6th, the 8th of the 8th, the 10th of the 10th, and the 12th of the 12th. So if your birthday was the 13th of the 12th, you instantly know your birthday will be on a... Sunday. <laughs> Unless it's a leap December or something crazy like that. But that extra day inserted between 11 and 12. Okay. Um, and similarly, for the odd numbered months, it's easy to remember. Uh, you just remember the phrase, I work 9 to 5 at the 7 11. Uh, the doomsday will always occur on the 9th of the 5th, the 5th of the 9th, the 7th, the 11th, and the 11th of the 7th. Uh, March the 0th is always the doomsday, um, which is easy to work out. And uh, the only remaining month is uh, January, which flips around depending on whether it's a leap year or not. Three out of four years, it's a leap year, and it's January the 3rd that's the, the doomsday. And every fourth year, or every leap year, it's not strictly every fourth, it's January the 4th. So can you see, with one key date in any month, just doing a very small mental calculation, knowing that the 4th of the 4th is a Saturday, you can very quickly work out the day of the week of any day in April. So, th what's that? February. Well, so February is March the 0th. Uh, February the 28th. So February the 28th is always uh, doomsday. So that's right. You get two for one. With, well done for counting and double checking. I like that. That's really good. Um, so the trick is just knowing the doomsday for each year. So this will now very let you, in, in a bit of men mental thought, within 20 seconds you should be able to work out the day of the week for any day this year. But what about the day of the week for any day in any year? Well, you need to know a method for working out the doomsday for any given uh, year. And Conway's got a really quick, neat, fast way of doing that too. I won't go into the details of telling you that, but if you wanted to amaze friends and family or just be able to work out the day of week of any day in a year, I only ever bother remembering the doomsday for the current year because I never have to think that far in advance, uh, then uh, do some private reading and look up Conway's method because it's absolutely fantastic. What a clever man and very practical too. But um, more to the point, more interestingly, oh, uh, he wrote this book, by the way, uh, or he contributed to this book with Guy, uh, called uh, The Book of Numbers, which I love, because it looks at um, the sort of um, the increasingly larger sets of numbers there are, like the national, the rationals, the cardinals, the irrationals, and then the infinitesimals, and it goes on looking at how these different sets work and relate to each other. And it's particularly interesting when he gets up to infinity, and he does a lot of work talking about all the different sorts of infinities, and some of you have had the pleasure, who's had the pleasure of studying infinity already? Has anyone done it? Rupert has. Are you excited by infinity? Yes, it's awesomely exciting. Countably excited. Oh, well, you could be more excited, but that can be another time. So he looks at all sorts of really cool stuff. And using the stuff from this book, which is a gorgeous book, but everything um, Conway does is gorgeous, uh, you can quickly learn that infinity plus one really is infinity. Uh, so if you say to your uh, brother, I hate you, and he says, I hate you twice as much, and I hate you three times as much, I hate you four times as much, I hate you infinity times as much, if you say, I hate you infinity plus one, you're just saying the same thing. You haven't one-upped him at all. What if you say, I hate you infinity squared? Is infinity squared bigger than infinity? What do you reckon? Turns out it's not. No, 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 no. What about, I hate you two to the infinity? Is that bigger than infinity? Infinity's not even a number. Oh, well, no, it's a cardinal number. Yeah, 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 yeah. A cardinal number. Yeah, it's a... 
Well, the cardinal numbers describe the cardinality of sets, the number of elements in a set. So the number of elements in an infinite set is, well, how many real numbers are there? Infinity. You've just given me a number. How many rational numbers are there? That particular infinity we call uh, LF0. But it turns out that LF0, 2 to the LF0, is astonishingly, but not surprising because we bump into our enemy exponentiation all the time, slightly larger than in <laughs> normal infinity. So there's this actual hierarchy of infinities. And then there are even infinities that are bigger than all the infinities you can get to by making infinities. And the inf infinity is a very exciting and gorgeous subject. Read this one book and you will know essentially nothing about infinity. <laughs> A very, very small proportion of all the amazing things. It's a gorgeous book. So Conway's great. But uh, what I mainly wanted to talk about Conway for today was uh, not his doomsday method, not to go on about surreal numbers anymore, but instead to talk about the game of life. And to talk about the game of life, we sort of have to start answering questions like, what is life? 42. <laughs> now, 42, I'm pretty sure, is the answer to a different question. No, it's not even the meaning of life. You've got to go back and check your atoms. I reckon. John von Neumann, the amazing American, whose chair Conway now has at Princeton, so he has to stand up, um, <laughs> was very interested in the idea of automata. So in the old days, people used to, in the 17th century, once clockwork was invented, they'd make amazingly lifelike clockwork figures who could play the piano or do a dance or something. These were called automatons. And we had Madame Tussauds where they made very realistic things out of wax. Human nature, humankind was trying to make artificial life, in a sense. Um, Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenfurter, lots of famous people have gone through trying to create artificial life, and there's lots of literature about that. And von Neumann was very interested in the idea of what is life and can we make a form of artificial life? Now, what do you think life is? If you wanted to make life yourself. Does it have to be chemical? A chemical reaction? So if I gave you a nuclear powered creature from another planet, they wouldn't be alive? Just playing the devil's advocate. What is life? What characterizes life? If we had to define what life is so we know when we've created artificial life, what would it be? What is the essence of life? It reproduces. It's got to be able to reproduce. Yes, it doesn't seem very sane if it doesn't, so i go with that one. That's a good one. Yes? Response to external stimuli. Response to external stimuli. Now, look, I was told that in Year 7 Science. <laughs> I, I don't know what that means, but uh, I'll take that on board as a possible difference. Do you agree? It's, it's a funny one. Somehow. What's that? It has to react somehow. Why? Uh, because otherwise it's kind of pointless. Well, it might be pointless, but it might still be like, I'm thinking like of Helen Keller, you know, the, the oh, right. yeah, okay. Essentially, she was alive, but for a long time, she couldn't communicate with the outside world, but it, you wouldn't say it's not valid. All, all those wonderful people that came back with, um, you know, the uh, Sachs, Oliver Sacks stuff that were paralyzed, and then they took this drug, and they suddenly came back to life, and they'd been in a coma, but they'd been aware for all those years, and no one had known dopamine or whatever it was, and then tragically, slowly went back into the vegetative state, but people now knew they were aware. So, so it's hard to know what life is. Whenever we think of something, we can think of a counterexample. Um, being able to reproduce seems pretty useful, though I imagine you could have one thing that never died that was alive that didn't reproduce. But I think self-reproduction is a pretty important quality. What else? Well, it's hard to think of the thing. So um, what, uh, what we'd, I think we'd all agree that these little uh, clockwork figures that play the piano weren't alive in any sense at all. Uh, are viruses alive? What about computer viruses? Are they alive? No. Yeah, viruses hijack the machinery of other living organisms. They don't even have the reproductive machinery themselves. They use someone else's. Yeah. But we're hijacking nature. Maybe we're viruses on that. You know, it's, I mean, it's this is a hard question. So he decided he'd abstract it all away and not worry about the physical details or the manifestations. Or the, he'd just look at the behavior and properties of life and how life man externally manifests itself. And he decided he wanted to make uh, something that he would call a cellular automata. So an automata, just like the clockwork automatas, but this was an abstract mathematical concept. Let me put the board lights on. And uh, he did it by having a, a, a matrix, a two-dimensional array of cells. The most amazing man. I think he's Hungarian. Not really sure. Does anyone know anything about von Neumann? He was Hungarian. Cool. 
So we've got this enormous matrix here. And then each matrix stored a number or had a state. It could be in some state. And I think he had some large number of states. I wrote it up there so I wouldn't forget what it was. Did I say 29 states? So this could be in state 0 or state 1 or state 2. And does this look a bit like something? Yeah, it looks like a grid. What is it? It looks, hopefully it looks like the microprocessor we've got. Essentially, he was envisaging um, computation. I mean, he's, he is one of the fathers of computation. So this stored a state, and this stored a state, and this stored a state, and all the grid was filled up with, with, with values that sort of state. And there was a set of rules that determined, given all the current states, what the next state of the grid looked like. Again, hopefully looking a bit like the microprocessor we've been pulling up. And he then tried to create patterns in here that had the properties of life, that would reproduce, that could do things, that had actions, that moved around and did stuff. He, he did all sorts of amazing work like that, but 29 states and a, a whole enormous complex set of rules, it was too complex. So Conway came along and thought, I wonder if I can simplify this. And he came up with a much simpler notion of a cellular automata, and since then there have been many, many others. It's a very exciting field, and you should just look them up and revel in their beauty. The game of life happens on an infinite two-dimensional grid just like this. But it only has two states, not 29, and each cell is either occupied or free. What's that? So the state automata, automata, automata. Oh, well, the automata, which I haven't actually talked about, means something in computing, uh, uh, finite state automata and infinite state automata. We will get to them in the last week. It uses the same word and it's got some of the same ideas in it. In a sense, this has lots of the ideas of a microprocessor in it. So we're sort of converging on the same points from lots of different points of view. But no, this isn't uh, uh, literally that. So this cell is filled in. This cell is filled in, say. And this cell is filled in. This might be our starting position. In the infinite grid, only three cells are filled in. And Conway fooled around the rules that determined when a cell would give birth, when it would be filled in, and when a cell would die, when it would go empty. And he wanted to have very, very simple rules. And he did. He had only two rules. If a free cell has exactly three neighbors, it gives birth. If an occupied cell has three or two neighbours, it survives. In all other cases, it dies. So overcrowding will kill a cell and loneliness will kill a cell. So this is one state here. What happens next? Which cells are going to live and which ones are going to die? Now let's not look at births yet, let's just look at occupied ones. Who has three neighbours? Or two or three neighbours? A neighbour is anyone in the eight squares surrounding you. So this guy has two neighbours, but these guys, one each. So this guy's doomed. He's going to die next time. He's going to die next time. This guy's going to persevere, though the future is not looking that promising. Uh, but can you see someone's going to give birth? Who's going to give birth? Middle. Middle. So the next state of this machine, it goes tick, tick, tick like this, will look exactly like this. What is the birth? What's that? Where does the birth? Uh, any cell that has three neighbours gives birth. So any unoccupied cell will become occupied if it has exactly three neighbours in the, in the previous round. Now what's going to happen to this state here? It survives. Does anyone ever give birth? No. No. It's like, it's like you're in a dead-end job. Don't, don't do this. <laughs> nothing changes. Nothing moves. Oh, what? How many neighbours do they have? Oh, no. With only one neighbour. Oh, they're gone. So that pattern didn't last very long. Okay, what about this pattern? What happens next? Now, let's see. Who's going to die next time? Anyone give birth? This guy gives birth. And this guy gives birth. We get a blinker. It's a self-sustaining pattern. It's the smallest self-sustaining pattern that I know of. And <laughs> it wouldn't be hard to exhaustively brute force test all possible patterns with three cells in them to see if any others were self-sustaining. Can anyone think of a, a self-sustaining self pattern that never moves is this one, for example. This is called a block. That just stays there forever. Yeah, yeah. It's quite awesome. Conway 
he, first he had sets of rules that quickly the shapes overflowed and filled up space really rapidly, and that was hopeless. And then he had sets of rules that were too mean and everything died really quickly, and that was hopeless. But under these sets of rules, some things live and some things die, and the complexity given by these two tiny little rules is absolutely astonishing. This is what we, in fact, call emergent behaviour, that the behaviour of the entire system, determined by these entirely deterministic rules, is way too complex for us to even understand. So, were we ever to be able to understand the position of every molecule in your body, and know every chemical reaction that was going to happen, and so on and so on and so on. Yes, if we were able to fully understand and determine and predict everything, and everything still was completely deterministic in that way, the question is, is that game over then? Is nothing interesting anymore? And what Conway, I think, shows here very convincingly is, well, no. Because we're here, given any state, we know exactly what the next state will be. And it's so mindlessly easy to work it out. Yet ask any question what, about what the thing's going to look like in a couple of states, or in a year, or what the whole system's going to change and become, if we've got lots of occupied cells, whoa. It not only seems hard, it's provably hard. In fact, it's provably impossible to answer many of those questions. So it's quite a lovely thing. Um, uh, what did I want to say about it? Oh, I wanted to give you some of the shapes. All right, let's just quickly look at... What's that? Yeah, yeah let's get there and look at some of the cool shapes. Let's... Uh, da, 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 da. Here, this, this shape here is a glider. Conway, uh, when he posed this question initially, he published it in Martin Gardner's amazing column. I've mentioned it a few times in Scientific American, Martin Gardner being awesome man and the annotator of the annotated Alice. Uh, he, he, uh, Martin Gardner publicised this, and Conway, in Martin's column, uh, put an open challenge out, saying he'd give a hundred bucks or something to anyone who could answer this question, which is: Is it possible to come up with a pattern that fill that that goes forever in some sort of interesting way? Uh, that doesn't die, that's eternal, uh, but yet constantly changes in, in some way. And, it's, and, and will perhaps even try and fill up space, a, a pattern that grows. So it has lifelike properties, that it grows and expands. And it's quite hard to prove that it does, because even if it seems to grow and expand initially, you don't know in 10 moves time if we're going to suddenly disintegrate or weird things going to happen. And he postulated that maybe you could come up with something well, the glider here is a very beautiful shape that in a sequence of, does anyone know, is it eight moves or four moves? What's a period of a glider? It essentially, if you follow this through, playing the rules of the game, rearranges itself, destroys itself and rebuilds itself, but it's shifted one square diagonally in the direction it's pointing. So with a period of, I think it's eight, with a period of eight, it slowly moves across the infinite plane through the outer space of the infinite grid, just moving on forever. And he wondered, maybe a way of solving this problem would be to create a glider gun, something that ejected gliders periodically, some shape that evolved and then occasionally spat out a glider. And some really smart guys from MIT did just that. They discovered a glider gun, which is amazingly small. And In fact, a very famous computer scientist now, Bill Gosper, who you probably know is one of the internet legends. Let's just look at some of the images we've got here. Discovered this when they were um, students at MIT. So there's a glider moving. It's only showing you a fragment of the world, but you can see it rebuilds itself, slowly moving along like here. Here's a glider gun. This shape here is the glider gun. It uses those two blocks. It's sort of, there's two things that explode and interact with each other, and then eventually hit the block and peter out, and they eject gliders. Here are some stable shapes. But here are some more interesting shapes. Here are oscillating shapes. You can see the blinker. some more amazing longer period shapes. Here's some moving objects. This one's very nice. <laughs> A swimmer. <coughs> Jellyfish. Okay, hundreds of shapes have been found. Now there's one interesting shape, the pentomino. Did I put it up there? The F pentomino. Pentominoes are, you know, ways of arranging um, five squares. Did I put it up? Pentomino? Oh, I didn't put the F pentomino up. Alright, let's just Google for it. There's one shape that starts with only five. Uh, oh, <laughs> I'm using the wrong keyboard. <laughs> Sorry. Uh. Ah, paste, damn you. Uh, I'll just type it in, F pentomino life. F pent 
pentomino. Uh, Anne says, what is the F pentomino? No, it's not going to give me a picture. I want a picture of it. Oh, it's just going to talk about it. Talk, 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 talk. Pentomino, Wikipedia. Ah, R pentomino instead of the F pentomino. No, I want the F pentomino. Where's the F pentomino? Oh, it's the same thing. Oh. Can you see? Is there someone that says animation? Oh, Wolfram normally does good stuff. Oh, yeah, okay. But here are the famous pentominoes. Yeah, okay. Where's my search? Pentomino life animation. It's a very small shape Oops. that explodes. And it seems chaotic. And you can trace it for hundreds of generations. And it's just erratic and getting bigger and bigger. And it doesn't even stabilize till after a thousand generations. So this small thing in it, it's like axioms in math, suddenly exploded, had all this implied complexity hiding in it. And as it got bigger and bigger and exploded, and so, you know, no one could believe this thing was still going on after 12,000, uh, you know, after a thousand steps. Before it stabilizes, it ejects off a couple of gliders, eight or something. Now, this was actually how we discovered gliders. And I want to now come back to this, this question that we were raising in lectures earlier this week. The difference between invention and discovery. Many interesting things about the game of life have been discovered because people have set life patterns in motion and watched what happened, looking for interesting cycles and creatures that grow and so on and so on and so on, or do interesting things. So they're sort of discovery. In, in other words, it's like the whole of the life universe is sort of implied by the rules and people are exploring it rather than inventing it. Um, did we get an animation there? I haven't pressed enter yet. Oh, <laughs> Wikipedia. Thank you, Wikipedia. Where's F? Go up. Oh, I passed it already? Why did someone say go up? Oh, yeah. F pentomino. There we go. Woohoo! Uh, the simplest pattern still lies. F pentomino. What does it say? But Conway discovered the F pentomino, which he called the R pentomino, failed to stabilize in a small number of generations. In fact, it takes 11, 1103 generations to stabilize. Ba -ba -bum. By that time, it's fired six escaping gliders and it's grown to size 16. So, for a non trivial, if we, with, we get that amount of complexity starting with four, imagine if for your assignment I'd asked you not about busy beavers in this six, you know, lame four by four grid with all those rules. What if I'd asked you about uh, questions about interesting things you can do in life? Now, Conway went on to do very interesting things in the game of life. Uh, particularly, he discovered an eater that is this shape that just sits there passively the whole time, but if a glider comes along, it gobbles it up and then returns to its waiting state. So it gobbles up gliders. And he discovered a reflector that if you send a glider against it, it would bounce the glider back in a different direction, or bounce it back exactly where it came from. And he discovered all these interesting shapes. And by assembling these little building blocks together, he was able to build a wire, where the gliders traveling along the wire encoded zeros and ones. And he was able to build AND gates and OR gates, where if there were two gliders traveling at the same time, they annihilated each other if they hit on the right angle. He built a knot gate. He made a way of bending the wires so gliders could go through corners. And he made a way of having wires that cross each other so glider paths could intersect without the gliders interfering with each other. And now he had the components of a digital computer. And in a game of life now, you can actually build anything you can build with AND gates and OR gates and things. So you can actually build any microprocessor in the game of life. And you can actually build a game of life program then, that, uh, a game of life emulator that is like Quine, like the Quine problem I gave you. You can build machines that build themselves, machines that solve problems, machines that go forth and do interesting things. Anything, in fact, that a computer program can do can be embedded in the game of life and encoded in patterns, and the game of life is actually doing it. So this becomes now very, very interesting, because if you imagine the universe of the game of life, and the power's turned on, and the universe is just filled with random values, and it's infinitely big in all directions, then all patterns that are finite in size will be there somewhere. And there will be creatures there, and there will be self-aware programs there, and there will be all sorts of things happening in the game of life. There'll be gliders traveling along, there'll be big empty barren spaces with a single guy traveling across, there'll be creatures that grow and populate, <laughs> there'll be love, <laughs> there'll be wars, and it will be there. Does, does that make sense? And in a sense, it's all completely virtual, and those creatures don't even know that they're, I wonder if they wonder if they exist or if there's a creator or anything. But those things are there. If a computer can ever do those things, then it will be there in a game of life somewhere. So the game of life is a truly amazing thing. And there are all sorts of interesting puzzles you can do with a game of life. Let me go back to the lecture notes. I get so excited about this. I could, 
there are awesome other ones too. I, I've got a couple of cellular automata I'm going to try and set as a puzzle for you guys to fool around with. Um, because it's sort of appropriate to deal with life. Um, oh, Bill Gosper. Bill Gosper, the, the guy that invented the, um, the glider gun uh, from MIT, he invent, he's written some really cool ways of making life go fast. It's, and, and this is why I'm saying it's sort of appropriate to talk about this in an algorithm data structure course, and I'm glad we can talk about it now. Because if I was to ask you to write something to simulate the game of life, a game of life simulator, you could do it by having, what, a 2D array to represent it? Do a, a faithful simulation like you tried for the microcontroller. You couldn't make it infinitely big, so you've got problems when people go off the edge of the array. And then you just pass over the array working out which cells are alive and which ones are dead. And if I said simulate a thousand generations, you could see how you could go. And years ago when I was teaching postgraduate algorithms to senior advanced students, I did set that as an assignment, to write the game of life and make it go as fast as possible. What do you think of the bottlenecks? What's going to slow down the game of life? So you've got this big array. If it's largely empty, you're going to be spending a long time searching through this whole huge array, which is potentially infinitely big, but presumably at any point you've got a bounding box of how big it actually is, because you're going to start with some finite thing, so it can never be infinitely big, but it can grow very large. You've got n squared cells to look at. So traveling around looking at every cell, working out if it lives or dies, is going to take you an enormous amount of time. And as the grid gets, the bounding box gets bigger and bigger, it'll slow down a lot. So maybe storing every single cell in the universe as a different cell in the array, in addition to being problematic memory-wise, because we're going to run out of memory, as you said, is also problematic speed-wise. So what's another way you could do this? Zorbus You could... Hash it? Hash it? Yeah. Zorbus hashing. Tell me what Zorbus hashing is. You would use it if you had like a chess game? Yes. Yeah. Oh, Zor, as in XOR. Um, I can't remember. Can't remember. That, that's okay. Hashing is a brilliant way of doing it. That's exactly right. Uh, um, and, and, in fact, hash life... Um, does that, it recognizes, it's, it builds up a hash table of all sorts of familiar patterns. And after a while, if it sees a familiar pattern, it knows behaviors of that pattern. It can look up that pattern really quickly. It knows what it's going to do. And it can simulate that pattern really quickly as a sort of a collection of things, as the, not as an individual cells, but as a sort of a, a total pattern, as an entity in itself. And as long as no other patterns, their space intersects with the patterns of this space, you can roll simulations forward very, very quickly. Um, but yeah, you might want to think about how you could represent the game of life and make it go really fast. And I had all sorts of races, and the best students could make it go astonishingly fast. The trick being for most students that um, unless the space was really densely occupied, in which case everyone dies quickly and it's not, uh, unless the space is densely occupied, it's easier to keep lists of occupied cells and work on your occupied cells rather than keeping lists or keeping track of all the spaces. Okay. So uh, a puzzle um, that I set the students then was this. I called it Ethel. Given a life state, the next state is completely determined. I wanted them to write a program that went backwards and given a life state worked out the previous state. And it turns out this problem is um, uh, is, is, is in this class of interesting problems, this, this function, the function to go backwards from life, and it's completely, in a sense, is not fully well defined because it's possible many configurations give rise to a given next generation. So in going backwards, you have a range of choices. For example, you could put a whole lot of single dots in the previous generation, and then they would all disappear in the next generation. So there's obviously an infinite number of precursors to any a given game, if it has a precursor. Um, and actually, there were some interesting states, Adam and Eve states, which it was not possible to get a precursor that would ever give rise to that state, which is interesting. And finding one of those was an, a challenge for them. Um, so uh, this is an interesting class of problem, one-way functions, we often call them. Functions that are really trivial to roll forward in one way and have, are governed by a really simple set of rules. But somehow the overall problem has enough complexity hiding in it that making it run the other way is really hard. And this is the basis of cryptography and all sorts of things like that. Essentially, you want it to be easy to go one way and hard to go the other. So we fooled around for a while with a sort of primitive crypto system based on running life backwards. And, and so the general idea of how to run it backwards, how I set the spec for that assignment was and make it, and then you could ask a question like, what does uh, the game of life look like a million moves ago? And that's a very hard question then to answer. Though you can work it out slowly, but it's incredibly hard. But it's really easy to roll forward. So you can roll forward and encrypt the message a million, but then rolling backwards is actually really hard. To, does that make sense? So you can pass the future game on where the message is encoded in the previous game. 
Uh, there are heaps more cellular automata you can look at. Uh, Langdon's ant is really fun. And, uh, but the main thing I wanted to say is that there's heaps more discoveries to be made. People are inventing new automata all the time. A, a lot of stuff, this was sort of exciting back in the 70s. Then for a long time, I think people lost interest or, I don't know, there doesn't seem to have been much work in it. There was a, a flurry of activity in the early um, 2000s. Some people came, came up with some more breakthroughs. But basically, I think this is a problem just sitting around waiting to be um, attacked by bright minds like you guys with powerful computation at your fingertips. So invent your own automata or answer more questions about the game of life and interesting patterns in it. Just play with it and have heaps of fun because there are many more profound discoveries to be waiting, uh, waiting to be discovered that are hiding there or invented, if you want to put it that way. Um, now, does anyone have any questions? Has anyone ever played the game of life? It's a zero. Apparently, there was a Sega game or an, an Amstrad or something. It was the least popular game ever. I think <laughs> you couldn't get it. It wasn't listed in the catalogs or anything like that. But if you got one other game, you could. there was something that discovered you could order this. And they only ever made 12 of them or something. Amazing. something like that. You've played it? It's on Windows 95. It's on Windows 95? It was on Windows 95 or 98. Yes. With like Windows Ski or something like that. Yes. Oh, cool. So you invented your own patterns and did all sorts of cool stuff. Yeah. Has anyone heard of Core Wars? Yeah, yeah. Tell us about Core Wars. Uh, the idea is that you have two programs that live in the same memory space and they have to try and just, you have to try and cause the other program to terminate. That's right. So two programs sharing memory. And I, I have a way of doing that with the R4242 chip. And I keep each year thinking I'll do, set that up as a brownie point challenge. Two programs living in memory, but alternating in execution or somehow concurrently running, they have to go around and find the other program and then try and wipe it out by overriding its code or data in some way. <laughs> and it's called Core Wars, and it was a really popular game a long, long time ago where people would actually have multiple programs in the core find, fight each other, trying to erase each other's program. Well, you can sort of do that with the game of life. You could imagine you could set up a pattern, you, you could create some initial pattern over here that's slowly expanding and exploring and firing gliders in all directions, trying to find where the other people are. Maybe you build some sort of glider that bounces back when it finds someone. And then as soon as you discover where they are, you start bombing them and you know, trying to destroy them. And meanwhile, they're doing, does that make sense? So you can do all sorts of core war type things in the game of life. Heaps of fun. OK, well, I, I think that's all I wanted to say about the game of life. Um, uh, why don't I want to? Uh, oh, I raced through everything. And I think I've actually finished. So I think we can have an early mark. What's that? I failed again. What did I say? Oh, oh, yeah, that's life backwards. Run backwards. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, all right, cool. Come down and ask questions or just, oh, yeah, there's a question just before you go. What's that? Uh, <laughs> they are truly awesome. I just have to work out how to get where I was. Where was it? Lecture slides. Oh, admin only. That's, that's why I can't see it. I haven't put the proper notes up. Oh, Fibonacci example. I didn't do that Fibonacci example. Do you want me to do that? I had a quick example for detecting loops using Fibonacci numbers. Um, it wasn't very hard. It was just back, looking back at task two. You know in task two, one of the challenges you were faced with was um, uh, you had to detect if a program was a terminating or... Um, uh, 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 or, uh, or a non-terminating program, if it went into an infinite loop. And if it went into an infinite loop, you wanted to kill it as quickly as possible because we were only interested in the terminating one, so we wanted to sort of rule those ones out as quickly as we could. And detecting it was, went into an infinite loop was quite hard. And, and the idea behind how you detect, or one of the ways of detecting if it's in an infinite loop, uh, was, uh, is a bit similar to the Fibonacci problem that someone posed on the forum. So I thought we, we should look at that. Someone said, if you look at the Fibonacci numbers, we start, say, 1, 1. So it goes 1, 1, 2. We just add up the previous two numbers. Yeah, yeah. So 3, 5, 8, 11, 19. Well, 19 is supposed to be. But if we're working mod 16, if we're doing it on the 4242 chip, what is it? Uh, it's not 11? 11. Uh, oh, yeah, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> that means this isn't right either. 21. Thank you. So it's not 21. It's, we're working mod 16, so it's really 5. And 13 and 5 is 18, which is really 2. And 5 and 2 is 7. And 2 and 7 is 9 and 7 is 0 and 9 is 
And 0 and 9 is? 9 and 9 is? Okay. So we're going to keep going like this, and it looks... You see, it just sort of goes on. It seems to be gibberish. And someone asked the question, do we ever get to zero? Oh, well, that answers the question. Um, but can you see, it seems to be some sort of fairly random sequence going on like this. So maybe you could even argue this is a reasonable way of building a random number generator in if you only had that many bytes of memory in that particular microprocessor. So my question to you is, will this go forever or will it eventually loop? Yeah. If we look at the whole sequence, the whole sequence at any point is determined by the two, the Adam and Eve that gives rise to the sequence. This is the Adam and Eve for the rest of the sequence. This was our original Adam and Eve, though often people start say this is the Adam and Eve. So the Adam and Eve determines the whole rest of the sequence. And if you ever see a 9 9 again, for example, then the sequence from then on will be exactly the same as the sequence from here on. Because the idea is that in anything, like in the game of life, if you ever see the same pattern again, if you ever hit the same pattern, then everything that follows from that pattern will be exactly the same because the system has no non-determinism. It's completely deterministic. So, will this ever loop? What's the answer to that? Yes, yes because you've got a limited number of Adam and Eves. Yeah, yeah. What's the most we got? We got uh, 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 16 uh, for the first one and 16 for the second. We've got 256 of them. So the longest cycle this could ever have is 256. And we could detect the cycle by just noticing when the we get the same configuration again, the same Adam and Eve. So you could sort of do that. I mean, one way of doing the loop detection for the microprocessor was somehow having something that stored the state of the system. And if you ever saw the same state again, then you know you're about to enter a loop. But of course, the number of states there is much larger, so we can't actually store the state, probably, if we have to store every possible state, but maybe we could store a hash at the state or something like that. And is that how people started fooling around with it? Yeah, yeah. okay, cool. That's a good way of doing it. All right, well done. Any more questions? Video. video. Oh, yeah, I'll put the video on, and those that have to go, go, and those that don't, sit down and rejoice in the brilliance of Groucho Marx.